from the Homestead Studios in Santa Clarita, California, it's Just the Tip Stir with Melissa Morgan. No added MSG. If you've got a tip for Melissa, a puzzle you're on the verge of solving, a sudden stunning observation, how to get that gristle out of your teeth so no one will know you were actually eating that pickled pig's foot, anything, tell us about it by calling the Tipster hotline at 832-TIPSTER. That's 832-847-7837 or send an email to jttipsters at gmail.com. You just might hear your tip on the podcast. And now here's your host, searching for that pot of gold at the end of the rainbow so she can finally turn in those damned leprechauns for embezzlement, Melissa Morgan. More cowbell? There was so much in that intro. My brain is spinning, and my brain is spinning because of the case we're going to talk about oh. and a few other things. So you have just added to the spin factor, and I'm probably going to just vomit from the centrifugal <laughs> force. That was not intended. Oh, it was intended. No, not really. It was intended. So you... We don't know what the other is going to say, um, tipsters. So producer Mark is some is like prescient. Sometimes he will, in his intros, which he takes great delight in writing, you know, separately from me because I have no idea what he's going to say, um, a puzzle you want to solve. And this is actually what's going to happen on this episode. I'm really I'm going to ask for help. Oh, I have never asked the I mean, I get it. The title of the show is just the tipsters because we want tips yeah we're always looking but yeah but this is like um this is a mystery from minnesota that is more mysterious be i mean just because i don't know a whole lot about the um the manner of death and i the law enforcement is releasing so extraordinarily little even to the family so it's an interesting case but um we i don't know that i Want to discuss your obsession with pickled pig's feet? Oh, come on now. I, is this is this a throwback from when you were a child and you would accompany uh, Gary Humphreys on? Yes. On we, shopping, or, well, well he, his job? Yeah, we would go, he, he was a salesman for SC Johnson, and at the time, when he was young, he, uh, he would go from store to store, uh, he had a, uh, you know, a route that he would go on, and he would... Uh, sell Johnson wax products to the various managers of the stores and there were these there was this chain that I think it still exists but it's very small now but there's this chain of small grocery stores called Dale's it Junior. It is the Dale's Junior you're going to talk about. Yeah. yeah. There's one I know left and the and that only one I know of in the San Fernando Valley around the Sherman Oaks Studio City area. It's on uh, Riverside Drive and it's yeah. a small yeah, small like family run and they Right, used to supply you with pickled pig's feet. Well, well, the, one of you know, my dad would stop at several Dale's Junior stores on his, and he would take us to work. The thing is, every summer, uh, each one of the kids got to go one day uh, with my dad to work. And with and seven so, kids, that's a uh, that's a week and a half of bullshit yeah, right, right there. Well, that was actually. Sorry. It was actually, it would be one a week, one kid a week. And back then, Ugh. he only had five. He only had five. Back, oh, okay. Back Sorry. Back when I was young. Ugh. But, but Ugh. anyway, Sorry. so he would, always make, <laughs> he would always make sure that we would have lunch. The lunch hour would be right around the time he would be going to one of the Dales Jr. And at the time, they would have on the counter a big giant jar of pickled pigs. Feet. And you got, you got gypped? Oh no! They're Mark, fantastic. Please don't. Why? They're, Why? They're, 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 no. They're, they're, they come in this big jar. Yes, I understand. Uh, Why? Big, big, Stop. Big, gray, Stop. slimy, Stop. vinegary. The, the guy at the behind the counter would reach in with his hand without you know washing it or anything and pull out one of these things and wrap it in in butcher paper. And then my dad and I would sit in the car and eat these things like <laughs> like animals. Oh, fantastic! You know, I may it may be too difficult to divorce you at this point because our lives are intermeshed but i can still fire you this is still my podcast i'll bet you there's some listeners out there who love the pickle i don't sweat. want to hear from them and in, in support of you i don't get I, all i can't get all gristly in your teeth i mm. please just stop or honest to god you're never gonna see a vagina again that belongs to me anyway. You can see other vaginas, but this is not happening. <laughs> I'm shutting Please up. don't say anything okay, else right all now. All right, all right. So in a in another connection, because you are prescient, my beloved tipster Karen, uh, who I've known since the seventh grade, sent me 
a fascinating article and all she did was tag me. She didn't say anything, so I don't know what she's trying to uh, impart. But it's it's a it's a lovely short um, article from Appalachian Magazine, and it's written by a young author who grew up in Appalachia and went to college and, you know, um, didn't understand that that her verbiage would be made fun of. Now, I can, I'm trying to I do remember maybe being a little harsh, uh, even in the seventh grade uh, to Karen because she said wash rag. W a r s h. Oh yeah, my and, grandmother used to say that. Yeah, and, and so I mean, I wouldn't call people like uneducated or hillbillies, but it is fascinating to me that your grandmother said wash rag and you also ate pickled pig's feet. Fucking hillbilly from California. I don't under you know. I guess hillbillies are everywhere. But, Listen, white trash comes in all shapes and sizes, baby. In all colors, not even white. It's just trash. Okay. I'm just calling you and your family trash. So I, I know I've mis, I mispronounced things. It's mo- more of a cadence than a mispronunciation. Believe me, and I try not to because it's, you know, accents and things like that are really bothersome to me. Sometimes they're fascinating, but mostly bothersome. I did, it did take me quite a while to figure out what my grandfather was talking about when he said a holler because that was something you did when you wanted to speak loudly. But a holler is uh, a mispronunciation of the word hollow, which means like a ditch. He would say like, you know, I was raised down in the holler. And I'm like, what the fuck's a holler? Even as a little kid, I was like, holler? But he was such a great guy, he wouldn't care if I called him, you know, white trash. And he totally would embrace that. His uh, I'll bet he ate pickled uh, pig's foot. His his grandfather was a, um, a moonshiner. And uh, he was constantly worried about the G-men. And, you know, he probably did eat pickled pig's feet. But you know what? I don't want to know about that either. I don't want to know about it from him or you. But this article is really fascinating. And the thing that struck me is how the author wraps it up and that a lot of the Appalachian dialect is reminiscent of Elizabethan English, which makes sense because the, you know, the settlers in Appalachia were the peasants of the British Isles. So the word like afeard instead of afraid, afeard is a Shakespearean word that kind of got weeded out as time, you know, went on. Um, I don't really want to call this dialect Appalachian English, but I guess it kind of is. Um, You know, the word, the words that end in an O, a long O, it's replaced with an ER, like holler for hollow or, um, you know, potato, potato. Really? Now that is interesting. Tomato, tomato, you know, that tobacco, tobacco. And and the thing that struck me is um, my first husband, his mother was a hill jackaroony. And uh, I barely understood the shit she said on an everyday basis. And, um, she, you know, she had funny colloquial sayings like um, I was hanging curtains and she goes, well, that's crookeder than a dog's hind leg. Now that made sense because a dog's hind leg is sort of an interesting, you know, way to describe something and you can kind of picture it immediately. But she also said a lot of other things. I was like, what the fuck is she talking about? Um, But at one point, uh, while before I'd married my first husband, um, I was in college and I could hear my mom watching a TV show on PBS. My mom was, just imagine the 180 of me. Uh, polite, intelligent, classy, quiet, just absolutely we had zero in common except that I loved her with every fiber in my being. Um, And she was my best friend and amazing. And she watched a lot of PBS, which I didn't. I was like, what's that? Pibs? What's Pibs? You were listening to Steve Martin records. I what? You're exactly, you were so on point, you don't even know. Yeah, I would be spending many hours in my room listening to comedy albums as my mother was, you know, watching PBS. And uh, she was watching a show about peasants in Scotland, I think. And they were in a bar. And it was crazy. She's like, Melissa, come here. And I came running in her room and and she said, listen, it's Lauren's mother. And, oops, I said his name, my first husband. It doesn't matter. It, it's that guy's it's that guy's mom. Oh, he, nobody's going to care. <laughs> it's my first husband's mom. And who, by the way, she's passed away. So I'm not I'm not saying anything, you know, that she's going to sue me. Although she, I, mean, I don't know if she knows what a, a court of law is. She used to pay all their bills in cash and kept it all in the mattress. Hand to God. So um, it's the country 
accent is basically the British peasant accent slowed down. So if you've ever watched uh, My Fair Lady or Pygmalion, um, which is what the the story is, what the movie is is based on, Liza Doolittle is a English peasant, and um, you know the professor's trying to get her to speak, you know, uh, the Queen's English. Right. The dialect is usually called Cockney. Cockney, exactly right. So uh, a a country accent is a Cockney accent slowed down. If you take a Cockney accent and just slow it down real slow, it suddenly it's a country accent. It's fascinating. It's totally fascinating really to is. me. Yeah. yeah, and it's based on Shakespearean English. So my beloved, you know, Karen, thank you for sharing this. I don't know if you're trying to shame me for, for making fun of Warshrag or if you think I'm mispronouncing things. But either way, I, lo- I still love you. And you can you can correct me. I think I've told this before on the podcast. The three words that tripped me up when I moved here were cement for cement down at the cement pond. I said cement. So like I said, it's more of a cadence than a mispronunciation, hopefully. Um, Detroit for Detroit. I had no idea it was Detroit. It's I said it Detroit. And you still um, do too, umbrella. by the I way. I do. I probably still do. Thanks a lot, producer Mark. And umbrella for umbrella. And it was uh, it was a lovely friend who pointed out. She's like, "What is that thing you're taking for the rain?" And I'm like, "An umbrella." And she goes, "No, it's an umbrella." And I'm like, "What?" <laughs> she was trying to point out to me. Yeah. Anyway. So, you still say umbrella too. I, I mean, God damn you, it! You don't even know you do it. I know it's it's, it's all right. Uh, you know it's, it's, it's my Appalachian uh, it's my Appalachian roots. I do I do try really hard. I mean I I'm I talk how I talk, and I've never really changed. I never had what I considered an accent, and I don't think you can hear it. I think there are, like I said, I think there are pronunciations, um, you know, that I that I do that are different or slower. The cadence and producer Mark has pointed out that when he has gone back to Kentucky with me, it's a it's a basket of uh I sort of say a basket of deplorables, but it's a basket of um different accents oh, in the same oh, area. It's it's that whole Cincinnati area there. The northern Kentucky Cincinnati area. I, I you can I think I've picked up five different accents standing in line at the Kroger <laughs> yeah. there by where you grew up. Yeah, and I don't I don't think I unless someone is very it's really blatant, I don't really I don't really pick it up. I don't really pick it up. I don't I don't notice it, I think, because I'm used to it. I mean, if it's something really like, you know, something extremely strident, I'm like, oh, that's a different way of saying it. But when I'm in Kentucky, I don't really, I don't really well, notice it. Well, that's where it. you grew up. You're used to it. Yeah. But I don't, I mean, I can't, I guess I can't be objective about myself, but do you, other than my, my three horrible trip words do you hear me speaking no you sound weird? you sound like you, you could have grown up anywhere in the united states that's what when i was managing comedy clubs comics from all across the country would say you're not from here are you and i'm like yes born and raised and i had one comic who was originally from chicago who said you have a broadcast standard voice and i'm like what what does that mean and he said you have a, a lack of accent i'm like oh Okay, so I think it's probably you know mixed Midwesterny or something. But other than holler, you know my my grandparents really didn't fuck up a whole lot of words. I'm hoping, and my mom I think was pretty good at not letting me say wash rag, even though I may have wanted to. There was something about insurance. I don't think I ever said insurance. I don't think I've ever heard you do that. I think it's insurance, but I definitely say uh, cement. And Umbrella and Detroit, which that's just heartbreaking. I have to get past that. Oh, but. you'll get over it. It's all right. So I got a lovely message from Tipster Ryan, who had submitted the case for last week for Joe Bryan. And he said, I think I'm going to wait. <laughs> I think I'm going to wait a while <laughs> to submit any more cases. And if I do, they'll have a happy ending. And I thought, you know, Tipster Ryan, I appreciate that because I, I thought that that case was going to kill me. Um, but it is still fascinating, and um, we want your tips at any time. We are thrilled to death to get emails from you at jttipsters at gmail.com. Uh, you can call us on the Tipster hotline, 832-847-7837. And if you have time, 
like our wonderful friend Shelly from Southern Girl Creations, if you could go to Apple Podcasts and rate us five stars or leave a review if you have some words you'd like to say about the podcast we would be really grateful. And Shelly left a lovely review for us, which she did not have to do, but we're really happy that she did. And we're really proud of her because you might remember that she uh, created the Just the Tipsters Tumblr that we gave away in September. And maybe it's time we do another giveaway, something exquisite that Shelly uh, creates because she really is an artist. And it's she's not a a uh, crafter like I am, where everything's crooked and weird. Everything she makes is beautiful and professional and unique and wonderful. And she is moving away from her Etsy site and in starting her own website, which is, we're really proud of her. And her website is southerngirlcreations.net. And she she does everything. These amazing tumblers, things with glitter, um, she can make things personalized for you. She made me a fantastic shirt for Christmas that has a cow wearing a Santa hat and it says, cowbells ring, are you listening? Just phenomenal. It's this um, vintage look kind of printed uh, t-shirt that's called Infusible Ink, I think. And she's she's just amazing. So so please check check out her website. We're really, really proud of her. So this well, wait, before you go any further, yes, sir. may the marketing department say one more thing? Absolutely. Our listeners uh, who are now who become uh, patrons of the podcast on Patreon.com can now get uh, early episodes. You can get the episodes every week, a day before anybody else. So that's a new benefit we're offering. And we, um, we hope that you will uh, you know, be attracted by that early access. Um, and become a patron of the podcast. And you can find out more about that by going to Patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com, and uh, forward slash Just the Tipsters, and you get all the other information you need to do that. So, all right, the marketing department is done now. I appreciate that, Producer Mark, because I am the worst marketer ever, and I completely forgot. <laughs> but, yeah, starting the beginning of this year, we had wanted to offer our patrons who are so... Uh, fantastic and wonderful and supportive. We wanted to offer them something other than the swag, which they get. They still get the swag, but now you have early access. So as little as, I think it's $2 a month you can contribute yeah. and you would get the podcast a day early. So so that's, um, I think, a lovely thing. And hopefully that will that will make you m- want to go and, and sign up and be a patron. And we are just really grateful for all of the the patrons, the supporters. Again, if, if it's not in your budget, consider leaving us uh, a rating or review. Those things are priceless too, but we're really grateful. You know, we don't have a network and we don't, you know, have a lot of advertisers and we're really grateful for the support that the patrons give us because, you know, this is a very high maintenance show and it's not really at all, but we're still really grateful for the patrons. It really means more than we can say. So this story is one I'm really going to ask for help and it's It's very confusing to me because I know so little about uh, firearms. So if guns are involved, I'm just going to kind of be sitting there scratching my head like, I don't know what's happening. So as far as shotgun deaths or gun deaths in particular, I would think if you're going to kill yourself, you would want to use something small, a handgun. But then again, what do I know, right? We've all seen TV shows where they're trying to prove someone either killed themselves or didn't kill themselves with a with a long gun by pulling uh, the trigger with their toe, either placing the gun under under the chin or I mean, it's all of this is very gruesome to talk about. But when someone dies mysteriously from a gun death during hunting season, it's it's even more overwhelming. So bear with me. Um, those of you who know about hunting about uh, the type of ammunition, the type of uh, weapon you would want to use. My understanding is that a shotgun, long barrel, two-handed, and emits shot, like as in buckshot, or or like in last week's episode discussing um, Joe Bryan's wife, Mickey Bryan, and how rat shot was used <laughs> in a handgun. Don't really understand. So a rifle, also long barrel, two-handed, and a bullet that uh, is rifled out of the um, out of the gun, kind of putting a spin on it. 
Um, so it has maybe more velocity. Um, well, it also acts like a drilling mechanism to drill into the whatever you're shooting into. Right, exactly. I mean, so I don't know what a Winchester 3030 is. <laughs> I don't know. I've, I, they have lots of pictures of it in this case. A Winchester 3030 would be a rifle. A deer rifle? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so, or, or a, a, I'm calling it a deer rifle, but a rifle that would be a classic gun that would be used to hunt deer. Okay. Yeah. So let's start at the beginning. 41-year-old Terry Brisk from Little Falls, Minnesota, is by all accounts a a happy, wonderful guy. Um, Married for almost 16 years, um, has four kids, uh, his parents are still alive, his brother adores him, just like a happy-go-lucky guy who kind of had everything he wanted in life. His family owned a, a... an agate or rock quarry on a hundred acres of land, which is typically where he would go hunting. And on Monday, November 7th of 2016, he checked into work and said, do you need me? And they said, no. And he said, you know what? I'm going to cut out of here early and I'm going to go hunting. Now he didn't tell anyone this apparently, but it wasn't a shock to his family because he would do this quite often. And it's hunting season. It's November of, you know, 2016, which is when, you know, deer season opens. Now, he's not like a a trophy hunter. It's more like a, a hobby or a sport. They do have an 11-point uh, deer head mounted in their home, but it wasn't something that he was, you know, that rabid about as far as like, you know, I'm a big game hunter. He just enjoyed the sport of hunting. So he cut out of work early and he went to one of his family's favorite hunting spot by the way it's on property that his family owns it's near their gravel pit this hundred acres that the family owns and law enforcement has narrowed down the time it's really odd at first they wouldn't narrow down the time law enforcement is keeping everything close to the vest no pun intended not hunting vest but vest and It's really odd the things they release and the things they don't release. So this was at first thought to be an accidental shooting. Except how do you call it an accidental shooting when someone is found and the gun's not around? That's, but mm -hmm, we have other, we have some theories. We're going to get to that, producer Mark. And I'm very interested to know what your opinion is because this is, this is really weird. So Terry Brisk, 41-year-old Terry Brisk, Cuts out of work early, goes hunting at his favorite place. His parents, Virgil and Babe Brisk, they see their son's truck parked near the the quarry. And they don't think anything about it. And that's about 3.30. They're like, you know, we don't, we didn't think anything because it's deer season and we know he's probably hunting. They had stopped by to check on the quarry because apparently they mine agate and agate can be, uh, you know, it's not like diamonds in South Africa. These are not blood agates. It's, you know, people trespass a lot and are rock collectors and may take things that, you know, could be pricey to them. But the the family was just like, it's not a big deal. We shoo people away all the time. You know, some of them can get lippy, but it's not, it's not a big deal. People, you know, we say, hey, this is private property, leave. And they do. It's not like agate collectors are typically going to be killing people to get no it's not valuable <laughs> stuff it's just stuff that collectors y- yes. you know yeah, i mean agates can be worth something but it's not worth a, a human's life yeah they're not worth thousands of dollars yeah they're anything. not and they're not uh, pray to god agate collectors aren't going to be killing someone and especially when you hear how how terry was was killed so around 3.30, his parents notice his truck in a field near the quarry. And again, they don't think anything about it. They checked on the quarry. They went home. At the time, right around the same time, between 3.30 and 4, his son, John, is passing by on the school bus and he sees his dad's pickup truck near the gravel pit. And he's like, you know what? I'm going to go home and I'm going to I'm gonna join him. You know, I'm going to, I want to go deer hunting with dad after school. So... He gets home and he asks his grandparents, hey, can you take me back to the quarry so I can go hunting with dad? Now, here's a piece of information I think is important to hold on to. And his grandparents didn't take him, but his mom took him instead. So we know that his son, 
his wife and his parents have seen his truck and are there. His son goes and sits in his favorite blind and he's like, I, you know, I'm trying to find him. I don't know where he is, but I know he can't be too far away. So he texts his dad a couple of times and there's no reply. He calls him and there's no answer. Now, this is what's sort of odd if you're a hunter. John, the son, said, I can hear his phone pinging, so I know he's close by. So he leaves the deer blind and he finds his father dead on the ground. And his Winchester 3030 rifle is missing. It's not around him. But he's dead and he's died from, he bled out, basically. Now, if you're a hunter and you take your cell phone, do you leave the ringer on? No. Right. So it's not a robbery. His phone, his truck, his keys, his wallet are all on him. Law enforcement will not release where on the body he has been shot. Okay, that's fascinating. How many times he has been shot. Oh. And it takes them a year to release that he was shot with his own gun. A year? A year. Now, here's questions. Again, more questions than answers. And I'm just going to apologize up front, except that this case is intriguing to me for many, many reasons. And again, because I don't know a lot about weaponry, I have many questions. Could he have accidentally shot himself, thought, oh, I can make it, and wandered somewhere and died? Yes, but we don't know where he was shot or how he was shot, so... Right. right. Yeah. If you shoot yourself accidentally and you have cell phone reception, would you use your phone to say, I've shot myself? Yeah, that's the part that, that doesn't make any sense. Right. If, if, if that's the, what happened. If he shot himself somewhere, uh, started wandering back, you know, you would think he would call somebody right. and say, oh my God, I shot myself, please come get me. Now we're talking about the woods, so a blood trail may have been difficult to find, but he was found really quickly. Theories are he committed suicide and his son hid the gun so that it wouldn't be considered suicide and they would get life insurance. Not uh, how old was the son? 16. Oh, uh, well. Not exactly as uh, not exactly viable because they had a successful business. They had everything they wanted. He had four kids. He and his wife seemed to be very happy. They had the family owned a um a shoreline property, so they had what they called a uh, redneck pontoon, but it was like a pier that they had just enough room for the kids, a grill, the dog, you know, they could go out onto the water. And, and his wife said, there's nothing better than that, is there? I mean, it's, he had everything he wanted. It wasn't, there, there was no indication that he was going to commit suicide. Would his 16 year old son, you know, oh gosh, dad shot himself uh, improbably, and I should hide the gun so that it looks like someone killed him, so we get insurance. Uh, that that's a stretch. It is. It's a very big stretch. There are also theories that someone close to him did this. A family member, potentially a son. Don't know why his son would have a reason to kill him, but it could happen. I'm not really leaning toward that, and I'll tell you why. It took. Five months, but the gun was found. Apparently, the Morrison County Sheriff's Department and the Minnesota State Police didn't do a great job. In April of 2017, the Minnesota Bureau of Criminal Apprehension performed another search of the property, and the Sheriff's Office said they found evidence, but they wouldn't say what. And then they don't release it until December of 2017, a year later. Well, we found his rifle. He was killed with his own rifle. And we know we have cleared his family. And this was not suicide. 
this was an intentional act. We don't feel it was random. We feel it was targeted. And that's all they say. They don't yep. give you any other. Nope. We don't know where in the body he was shot. Was he shot more than once? That would, to me, he must have only been shot once because at first they said it was accidental or suicide. I don't know how one could have <laughs> could have thought it was suicide when his gun wasn't around. Right, uh, right. His gun wasn't found for five months. I don't know how you call it that. You can call it accidental, but would it be more like manslaughter? Is it? Is he hunting with Dick Cheney? Is, you know, a friend shooting him and, and then, oops, I shot him. I got it covered up. I, I don't. Why would he be using his gun? Right. Using his gun. Right. That doesn't make sense. So I again, these are all questions. I'm you know I'm not uh, smart enough to answer. But would an experienced and I mean experienced hunter hand his gun to anyone else? Only if it was some uh, 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 if it were a friend. Right. Somebody that, that, you know, oh, hey, there. Let, hey, that's a great uh, Winchester. Can you I got see there. it? Can I see it? Uh-huh. Right. Would you hand it to someone with the safety off and loaded? No. Okay. I, I, again, these Not are... Not if you're an experienced right. gun owner. These are, these are questions I'm asking because I don't, I don't know... You could you could hand it over if you know. Hey, hey, I love your gun. Can I take a look at it? You 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 might leave it loaded, but you put the safety on before you handed it to him. One would think. And would you hand it to him all loaded? I don't. I don't. Oh, you might. Sure. You might. Okay. If you're out hunting, yeah. I I feel like these are um, you know, these are these are all questions like could he have accidentally shot himself. Like he's not experienced and he didn't know how to hold it and he shot himself and then he tried to walk and then he collapsed. Well, obviously the police don't think so. They but. don't at this point. I'm just, I'm I'm asking questions <laughs> because this is, you know, it wasn't an accidental uh, shooting because he was dressed in orange. You know, very few right. deers wear orange outfits. Um it's a state law in Minnesota that you have to be, you know, pretty much predominantly head to toe dressed in orange during any sort of firearm deer season. And he was very, you know, very adept at at knowing the laws and, and obeyed the laws. This is his own family's property, but he's not stupid enough to wander around, you know, wearing antlers or something. I mean, it's just. Yep. It doesn't make sense. It had it, it, it had to be. The only thing that I could think of is is the scenario where it was a friend that asked him for his gun, somebody that he knew asked him for his gun, and whoever it was shot him with it. Right. Um, and that might could have been his son for, you know, if that's what, but they say they've cleared the family. So, you know, I don't, I don't know. The only, the only thing I can think of is that he uh, um, voluntarily handed the gun over to somebody, maybe at gunpoint. I don't know. Right. But s- somebody... He handed it over to somebody. Would, um, that's another theory is, could there have been more than one offender? Could there have been two people? And one person had a gun on him, held on him, and he surrendered the gun to someone else who then yeah. shot him with his own gun to make it look like it wasn't murder. Or that, you know, that it, he was shot with his own gun and maybe just leaving a big mystery. If you're going to murder someone, murdering them with their own gun is is interesting but then you should probably figure out a way to stage it so that you know the gun isn't far away <laughs> yeah i mean maybe just, they just didn't care i mean if well they, they there's fig- that they figure well i'm gonna shoot him with his own gun it doesn't care what what's mysterious though why didn't they just drop it there where they shot him right why did they have to go take it somewhere else to drop it why I, wouldn't you take his phone and his wallet and his keys and make it look like you know maybe you even dish him somewhere and make it look like you know a robbery. Why? It does have a lot of questions. It's it? it's unfortunately more questions than answers. So about a year after, in 2016, the sheriff's office says we're asking the public for tips. We're asking for help. We've ruled out that this is an accidental shooting, and it's definitely a homicide, and that's how we're moving forward. We've ruled out the family, uh, the widow, the children, the parents. It started with a ten thousand dollar reward and went up to twenty thousand. It's now thirty thousand dollar 
uh, reward for any information. They keep increasing it. Oh, so here's the, here's the time of death they released. It's uh, between 226 and 420. <laughs> 226 may have been when he checked into work and said, you know what, it's slow, I'm leaving. And 420 must have been when John found him, his son found him after school, got dressed and went out to, you know, to find him. I can tell you that things are not good with the family. I don't know if there had ever been any kind of a rift, but his parents, who are still alive, who, by the way, a heartbreaking part of this story is that Terry had helped them move an extraordinarily large piece of granite that they had wanted to save to use as their headstones. And within a short period of time, it became Terry's headstone. Oh, that's terrible. It's, it's, you you can just feel your heart breaking and his parents seem to be leading the charge on, you know, please help us find out what's happening. They've erected a 12 foot yellow cross right in front of the large piece of granite and as a memorial because they're hoping anyone who passes by will see it and they're hoping that whoever did this will be reminded apparently this you know the the quarry is kind of off on a side road but you know there's a main road uh as far in little falls that you know that you have to go up and down to get to anywhere and they're really hoping that this maybe wears someone down So, you know, his mother, babe, is like, he isn't a fighter. He wouldn't fight someone over a deer. If if there was a deer and they were fighting over it, he would say, go ahead, take it. Deer's plentiful. White-tailed deer are very plentiful on this hundred acres of wooded land and rolling hills. Go ahead and take it. His wife, you know, has said that it would have been like about two months later, January 13th, that would have been their 16th wedding anniversary. She said they had met at a wedding and they had danced together at the wedding reception and they'd been together ever since. She says, I don't know how to feel anymore. It's hard to sit here every night without him. I guess it would be great if they found something, but it's not going to bring him back. Now that's Pam Brisk saying this about her husband. And I believe that his mom and dad are at odds with her. They've said they don't get to see their grandchildren as much anymore. And they've said they want other people to feel about Terry's case the way they do. So, Producer Mark, can you roll that clip? Yes, this is from this is from K.A.R.E. in Minneapolis. And there are some minor uh, audio glitches in it, but that's on the uh, on the tape. So here we go. 634, it's a case we've been following for a year now, the death of a Minnesota deer hunter. Yeah, it was one year ago today, Terry Brisk was found dead while hunting near Little Falls. And ever since, the homicide case has stumped the community and tore family apart. Our McArdle, she's been following this case for over a year now, and you talked with Terry's parents once again. Yeah, it's been several months since I talked to them last. Um, and I wanted to see if anything was changed. And in some ways, yeah, a lot has changed for them. Babe and Virgil Brisk are learning to live without one of their sons. They're trying to deal with the sleepless nights, and they say this ordeal has torn their family apart. Terry leaves behind a wife and four children. His parents tell me they don't get to see their grandchildren as much anymore. They say this past year has been lonesome and heartbreaking. They put up a monument and a cross in Terry's honor on the land where he died. But the case is always on their mind. It tears a family apart. It really does. It's, it's, it's hard feelings, things you get mad at other people and family members because you want them to, I don't know, think more about him than they do. And I guess it's because I'm his mom, I just feel like that. One thing that hasn't changed, this couple is not letting go of hope that someday Terry's killer will be found. And all they said was Terry wanted out of life was his family and just to live comfortably. That's all he wanted. Do they feel like there's any progress being made in the case? They do, yeah. With last week announced that his gun was found and that it's being tested by the BCA, they they feel more hope. But they want that big answer that that person has been found. So hard. Thank you, Ellery. So that's the voice of a mother who is obviously grieving the extremely confusing murder of her son. And here we are 
She's now 73 and Virgil's 82. And he says, before I die, I want to know who killed my son. And of course you can't blame him. You know, Babe says, I know they're working on it and they just can't say a lot. They want to keep, you know, evidence to themselves and it's information that only the killer knows. So they are really eking out little pieces of information. And they're saying Terry absolutely knew his killer. That's what they're saying. I don't know if that's a really big clue or, you know, they're now saying it's not a stranger. It wasn't a, you know, an attempted robbery that never happened. It wasn't a fight over a deer. It wasn't agate collectors. They're saying a definitive statement like that from the sheriff's office. Terry, it was actually the headline. And, and by the way, there's some really great um, coverage in the Star Tribune uh, writer, Mary Lynn Smith. She actually um, is one of the contributors to, the, is, it, is it K-A-R-E, producer Mark? Yes, the, yeah. yeah. She was one of the contributors to, to that story and that clip. But she is um, she's a newspaper journalist, the Star Tribune, and she's doing a wonderful job of covering this. And the most recent thing I could find was November of 2019. So it's been three years and they have nothing really, except he was murdered with his own gun. And the sheriff releasing these little teeny pieces of information, you know, these little teeny tidbits, a gun that was found five months later, after what had to have been a pretty big search, found by another agency, they've even brought the FBI in. It took two years, uh, well, a year and a half. It was March of 2018. The FBI became involved. There's nothing being released about their impressions. I don't know if the BAU, you know, who who shoots a guy with his own gun. I mean, it's so, there are so hmm. many. You know, it. What, what, what it sounds like to me, just hearing all this, what you're telling, what you're, what you're saying that the, the police have released, it sounds like they have a suspect. It's because they're saying it was definitely someone he knew. They're strongly implying it was a friend. It sounds like they may actually have a suspect, but they're not going to release the name. Well, it that makes sense that they probably have several people under under the microscope, although they have come out many times and said the family has been cleared. Maybe they'll change their mind. Sure. I mean, this is, you know, this is a quote from Morrison County Sheriff Sean Larson. There's no doubt Terry would have seen the killer. So I'm going to guess he was shot in the front. Okay. That's just a guess. Now, you know, again, we've seen a lot of um, TV shows where someone, mostly men, probably not a lot of women would shoot themselves with a long gun. And it can be done, but unless he's found with like one boot off using his toe to pull the trigger. Um, I was trying to measure my arms <laughs> to see how long, not that I would want to shoot myself with a, a rifle, but um, I guess it could be done, but it would not at all be easy. And the gun would be found near me unless I shot myself in as there, you know, other suggestions that he st staggered and stumbled Maybe it was an accident. Maybe it was on purpose. Maybe he didn't die immediately. How long do you live after you shoot yourself? <laughs> Since we don't know exactly where it was, you know, maybe it took him a while to die. I don't know. It doesn't sound like it. It sounds like he dropped where where he was shot and bled out there. If he had wandered around or staggered around, there would be some sort of blood trail. They wouldn't have immediately, you know, thought, uh, oh, it's a suicide or an accident. It, it to me that's like he got he got shot and dropped if they at first thought this could have been an accident or this could have been suicide he wouldn't be wandering around <laughs> bleeding and saying oh i made a mistake i don't I, I don't think so at all there's also the timeline if it's between you know 206 and 420 that his wife could have gone to the quarry and shot him and his parents showed up at 2 30 and his son showed up at four and found him at 4 20. I'm not saying I have absolutely no idea why his wife would have done that. I have, I mean, she, Pam seems like, you know, a widow that is going through terrible things and without, without her partner. 
you know, and that they had what they wanted. They had everything they wanted. They well, had the a great one thing, life. The one thing that's, that's you know, it, I'm sure it's nothing, but the, the fact that the, that his parents are saying, well, she's not bringing the kids by anymore. Or, yep. That's a little suspicious, maybe, if you have a suspicious mind. Well, if you listen to what his mother said, she sounds like a hurt mother. She doesn't sound like an accusatory mother. She said, feelings get hurt. Um, people don't feel the same way you do. Um, you want them to be as invested in in Terry's case as we are. It sounds more like she thought that maybe Pam wasn't, you know, doing enough. And you could hear in Pam's voice. She's like, I guess it would be great to know, but it, you know, what happened, but it doesn't bring him back. To me, what that sounds like is that Pam has a mindset that it's one thing and the parents and the sheriff think it's something else. I mean, you know, the sheriff is just, this is an intentional act of violence. There's no doubt Terry saw the killer. He had some interaction with the person. You know, this is not random. This is not an accidental, you know, deer shooting. This is, like I said, I almost apologize for doing this case because there's more questions than answers. But there is a $30,000 reward being offered um, anonymous donors from the community who want Terry's case solved. And you can anonymously contact the Morrison County Sheriff's Office at 320-632-9233. You can call Crime Stoppers of Minnesota at 1-800-222-TIPS, 1-800-222-8477. If you know anything about what could have happened to Terry Brisk, in November of 2016, please let someone know and more cowbell. And remember, you can always call the Tipster Hotline at 832-847-7837. If you want to become a patron of the podcast, go to patreon.com forward slash just the tipsters. <laughs>